We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. So when the war finally ended, there were many iterations of investigations that would start and stop. But I know one of the first ones, they went to the lake, they threw a bunch of dynamite in the lake, hoping if his body was there that it would rise to the top. And that didn't happen. So, you know, the first search for his body in the lake was unsuccessful. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This episode is presented by Matt Fulton and produced by Chris Carr. Hello and welcome back to Secrets and Spies. It's Matt here this time. On today's podcast, we have a historical spy murder mystery for you. I'm joined by author and journalist Pate McMichael to discuss his book, Operation Chrysler, Stolen Valor Behind Enemy Lines in World War II. It's a story of greed, betrayal, and intrigue set in Northern Italy during the closing months of the Second World War. Just before we start, I want to thank all of our supporters on Patreon. If you're not currently supporting a show on Patreon, please consider doing so. Supporters now get access to a special show with Chris and I called Extra Shot that immediately follows our Espresso Martini episodes. Depending on the subscription level you pick, you get either a set of Secrets and Spies coasters, I have one here at my desk right now, or a Secrets and Spies coffee mug. We also have a Redbubble merchandise store. You can find a link to all of the above in the show notes. If you're not in a position to support us financially at this time, that's quite all right. Please just leave us a five-star rating and a review on your podcast streaming app of choice. Each new review helps to juice that algorithm and helps new listeners find the show. So that's enough from me, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Hey, McMichael, thanks for coming on the show today. Just before we get started, for the benefit of listeners, um, tell us a bit about yourself and your work. Hi, everyone. I'm Pete McMichael. Um, I'm the author of uh, my first book, which was called Clandestine, and it's a story uh, about the Martin Luther King Jr. assassination. Um, I'm also a journalist, so for many years I've written uh, long-form magazine pieces, and currently my my job is I'm the associate director of the School of Journalism at the University of Arizona. So I've been a professor for over a decade. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so we're going to talk about today uh, a book you have out called Operation Chrysler, uh, Stolen Valor in Behind Enemy Lines in World War II. Um, and it's a bit of a historical spy murder mystery story, um, one that I was totally unaware of until I had the chance to read your book. And something that really struck me is it's quite a uh, sad story of greed and betrayal that never really had its chance at justice. Um, but we'll get all into that. Um, but uh, so, yeah, tell us tell us a bit about this about this story. You know, it was one of these rare things. I was in the National Archives and I was finishing up my first book and really looking towards um, getting some research going on a second book so I didn't have to wait five years. Um, and I just ran into this story, um, and it really, I, I now know, came through a lawyer I was researching uh, for another project. Uh, this lawyer uh, was a partial owner in what used to be called the Washington Redskins football team, the commanders now. He was really famous in his day, I believe his name was Edward Bennett Williams. Really intriguing figure, plugged into D.C., knew everybody. Um, and he eventually represented Aldo Accardi, who is uh, one of the main characters of the book, uh, Italian-American who fought behind enemy lines in World War II. 
alongside Major uh, William Houlihan, who uh, is the person who goes missing in the story and, and who is later we learn is, uh, is murdered. So, you know, the records themselves kind of dictated that I stay with it because when I finally got access to the files, what I realized I was looking at was a Department of Justice prosecutor file. And it was the exact file they were taking into courtrooms and, you know, preparing to enter into evidence. As the readers of the book will learn, um, the reason this evidence never made it into the court proceedings is simply because there was a mistrial called in the very early stages of uh, the government's prosecution of Aldo Accardi. And it was because uh, they had really set him up to commit perjury. And so the judge... Um, you know, once he, he called a test, there was a, a congressman who was testifying in the early stages of um, Cardi's defense and basically admitted that they called him before Congress so he would retell this version of what happened over in northern Italy. And then they knew they could charge him with perjury, uh, which they did. And the reason is they could not charge him for any crimes he committed behind enemy lines during World War II because there was no law in the books that gave them that authority. So once a person was, uh, you know, dismissed from military service, um, at that time, the government could not go back retroactively and prosecute them for things they might have done. Uh, that since changed. It changed because of this case. Uh, but it's one reason why um, other researchers probably were never interested in the story, why it, you know, it had a little run in the early 50s, and that was about it. So uh, your book kind of starts in September of 1944 in the uh, closing stages of World War II. An aircraft with a team from the Office of uh, Strategic Services, the forerunner to the CIA, uh, departs um, Algiers, crosses the Mediterranean through a lot of uh, German anti-aircraft fire. And uh, this team parachutes into uh, northern Italy. Um, occupied by German troops. What was their what was their mission? What were they there to do? So uh, this particular team um, was there to go way behind enemy lines because the fighting had really stalled out, you know, uh, much further mm -hmm. south in Italy, uh, just above Rome. And there were a lot of partisans uh, in this particular part of Italy because it was right near the Swiss border, and they had started taking to the mountains. Um, and so I think the theory was we need to get somebody up there to organize the partisans so that when we do break through uh, and we are able to eventually kick uh, the Nazis out of Italy, uh, we know who we're dealing with and we, we know that we're not going to have a civil war similar to what was going on in Greece where there was a lot of bloodshed and, so you know, infighting. So I think that was part of it. The other thing was obviously strategically looking at the Russians and knowing that they had influence among some of the partisans and, and sort of, uh, you know, early, early pre-stages of the Cold War beginning. Um, and so they, they sent this small team uh, up there. They were originally different missions and they combined them. They called them Chrysler. Um, and then I think the most faithful decision is they put... Uh, this 40-year-old commander, Major Houlihan, in charge of it, despite the fact he did not speak Italian. And many of the other uh, members of the mission were Italian-Americans who uh, had some competency with the language, um, although they were not all from that particular region where that particular dialect was spoken. So Accardi was from that area, but like Carl LaDolce, who's important in the book, he was more of from Sicilian heritage. So, you know, his Italian would only get him so far. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they, they were there to organize the partisans. They were also there to drop a lot of weapons. And so they, they had radios with them. And so it was about setting up a communication line between the partisans and a very secret organization in Milan. And then also being able to use those radios to uh, request drops when needed for guns, food, uh, because that area had become very barren. There was very little gasoline, so very few people had cars. Um, you know, the Nazis were um, had significant forces there. And so, of course, they were taking everything for their own advantage, for their own use. So, you know, the partisans 
could make friends pretty easy because they they had some money with them. Uh, they had these gold coins with them, and um, you know they were just there really to to see what was going on and get ahead of it um, before it was too late. Great, thank you for that. So your book goes into uh, a lot of detail in in Major Houlihan's background. So he wasn't quite always the the type to be in the OSS. So could you tell us a bit about how he got to lead this mission? Absolutely. You know, it's what's frustrating about a project like this is you can only write what you can establish. And so uh, there's very little about Houlihan's life because he was such an ordinary person. Um, He did extraordinary things. He grew up in a family of uh, Irish American ancestors uh, living in Manhattan um, and also in Westchester County. Uh, His parents were from very humble backgrounds. Um, but he started out, uh, at Manhattan college, which I believe also had a high school. So I think he went there for high school and then got his undergrad degree there. And of course was like a 4.0 student, um, because he was such a good student that got him into Harvard law, uh, which became very instrumental in how he got recruited for the OSS. But along the way, you know, he, he was in the army, and so he loved the cavalry division of the army, and he served um, in different capacities all over the country. Um, I was fascinated to learn uh, that he had lived out in San Francisco, and he had been a part of the, I think, the California Air National Guard. Um, he also served down in like Panama, uh, where the Panama Canal was, and he also took these secret missions that or just amazing and fascinating um, in Central America and I believe South America where he was trying to uh, identify what the Nazis were up to in those countries because there was so much fear that they might try to, you know, invade um, or at least have influence there that could be used uh, against the United States. So he had a he had a very interesting career, and then as a lawyer, he was one of the first securities lawyers. He uh, befriended Justice uh, Douglas of the United States Supreme Court uh, many years before he was a justice, and he tried these um, kind of criminal uh, security fraud investigations. There were a lot of penny stocks, uh, bucket shops, is what they called them, and. You know, this was in the early days of the SEC, which employed him. So he was employed as a prosecutor for the SEC and just increasingly became very uh, disenchanted with law work, clerical work, uh, as the war became more um, inevitable, he started seeking action and started seeking, you know, more contact with, uh, you know, the field. And, and increasingly was asking not to be put in certain positions because the Army wanted to take advantage of his uh, legal expertise, not so much, you know, his, his, um, his field work. Great. So the, the closing phases of World War II in Europe, especially in, in Germany, uh, were a bit, I guess, tidy as far as wars go. I mean, you know, uh, Berlin was conquered. A lot of the senior Nazis were killed or captured. The victorious allies split Germany up into their own zones of occupation. New governments were established in those zones. Sort of the rest is history. But that really wasn't quite the case down south in Italy. It was uh, very chaotic. You alluded to previously the risk of civil war there was quite real. A lot of the partisan groups had um, serious communist influences, and I think there was a lot of concern that communism would just take over in in Rome after the war. So Operation Chrysler, as you said, Major Hollihan, his his job was to jump into northern Italy and kind of get these various partisan groups together into one cohesive force to kind of keep the country 
uh, together. Can you say anything more about the type of characters, the Italians that he was that he and this team that he led were there to work with? Yeah, I certainly can from what I know. And, and you know, the thing I'll, I'll tell your readers is, um, you know, I'm not a mm-hmm. historian by trade. Um, I don't know the history of, of Italy during the war that well, but I do know this sort of field level experience they had. So, you know, when they landed, um, they were originally working with more uh, democratic forces, right? And there was a group that had really... Uh, taken power in this region. Uh, I believe the guy's name was Didio, and he had like significantly taken territory from the Nazis and was holding it and even had like his own little stamp for the region. And right when they arrived, uh, they were being protected by this group. And all of a sudden, the Germans did a mop up operation. Several of Chrysler's men. Uh, basically got separated from the group and had to sneak into Switzerland, uh, and they barely survived the fighting. Didio was killed. So that pushed them into the arms of a partisan named Giorgio, who was, I think, um, very strictly anti-communist, but also not very scrupulous. He had a much smaller force, but he was there, and he offered the mission protection, and the mission got under his thumb pretty good there for the next few months. But the biggest player in that region was um, this guy, Muscatelli, who uh, became a very famous partisan. Um, his group is the one that killed uh, Mussolini and triumphantly uh, you know, came into Rome in a, in a car uh, at the end of the war. Uh, and then was uh, a real thorn in the side of the Americans, I think, for many years because of his communist influence. The thing about him was he he had ties to the Russians or the Soviets. He um, he he showed power and he was organized. And it would have been a lot easier for the mission to just partner with him from the get go. But the thing that Houlihan knew is that. You know, he was using them and he wanted to get as many guns from them as he could to, you know, secure that he was in charge. And so there was tension right off the bat um, between Moscatelli, Giorgio, and then, of course, the Chrysler mission. Um, and there's some fateful meetings along the way uh, right before Major Houlihan disappears that later you know, some people tried to use as uh, an explanation for the motives behind Houlihan's disappearance. There was also a committee for national liberation, and one of the members of that committee was with Chrysler. Uh, I call him Captain Landy uh, because the Italian names are are just harder for, you know, American readers to pronounce, (laughs) and these were their battle names. So it was a way for me to not put names in the book that people couldn't say. Um, And so... Captain Landy was an economics professor, um, but he was really making this sincere attempt to organize everybody and treat everybody fairly. And so the way that this operated was when Chrysler needed something from partisans, they went through this group in Milan, which had a secret radio there that the OSS had provided them. And so Captain Landy was really the the honest broker in this group um, who could work with all the different partisans and and was making this sincere effort to keep them together. And I thought that was fascinating and and really wish I could have learned even more about, you know, the nature of that resistance, because um, even though they were all fighting for a common objective, they were all very much planning for the aftermath of the war and strategically trying to get as much power as they could. And then he also, the mission also met with... um, who became the future president of, of Italy? He was uh, he was there. He met the, he actually met the mission right when they arrived and got captured. Um, so he was actually sent to Rome uh, on behalf of the partisans. And when he tried to re-enter through Switzerland, uh, he got captured and spent the rest of the war in a prison camp. So after the liberation, he was released and briefly became president of a very divided country 
and didn't really last very long. So, you know, th- they're all the big players are there. And I think folks that know that history better than me would recognize those names as very powerful people, important right. people. Um, but it was just essentially a big mess, I think, when they landed. And it was very difficult to know who to trust, very difficult to know who really had power, who thought they had power. Um, and on top of that, they have the Nazis, you know, at any moment ready to um, mount a huge assault against them and wipe them off the face of the earth. So, uh, you know, it was not an easy assignment. And they were in uniform. U.S. uniforms. They were. And that was just because Houlihan, being a lawyer, believed in the Geneva Convention. And, you know, uh, there's some disputes about whether or not they did take them off at times or not. Um, But that became a big sticking point later um, and and spoke to some of the fear maybe that some of the other members had. They felt early on, I think, that Houlihan was a taskmaster. He was someone that was, you know, in charge and you were going to do it his way or the highway and including wearing your uniform despite the risks that that might put you in. Right. So the first half of your book really kind of sets up the scene with uh, Operation Chrysler's objectives, the various resistance characters that they're working with. And a lot of it is um, set, I think, pretty vividly up in northern Italy, northwest-ish of uh, Milan in the Piedmont region around Lake Cuomo. Um, most of it is centered on on Lake Orta in like old abandoned villas owned by uh, Italian fascists that had long since fled, uh, old churches that they hide up in the vaults to avoid um, German patrols. There's like a basilica on an island in one of the lakes that they visit. It's a very cool kind of... Um, setting. But one one aspect of this mission that I guess led to a lot of the, I want to say, tensions between uh, Major Houlihan and his um, subordinates were the money that was involved that they were, uh, I guess, giving to these partisan groups. I think it's a uh, 1,650,000 uh, Italian lira um, Swiss francs, uh, French Napoleon, um, gold coins. So I guess if you could just let's go into a bit of the of the 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 money aspect of this mission, maybe how that started to to corrupt things. Absolutely, uh, money's always the, uh-huh. the thing. Um, <laughs> so you know when they, I mean, first of all, when you wrap your head around something this wild, right? The idea that you're going to go and do this. Um, Money's not the first thing that comes to mind, but it is probably the most important thing they had on them. Um, so when they jumped, Houlihan had these uh, particular gold coins that they knew they could exchange on the black market uh, to get lira. And so he actually divvied them up uh, because if he was killed or he went missing, you know, at least the mission would have some money. So that was very smart. Everybody jumped with a little bit of these coins. And then as soon as they landed, he demanded that those coins be returned. And he kept them on him in a haversack with his initials. They weren't chiseled into it, but it was like it was leather. And it was like he had just like taken a pen or something. And just you could see the outline Mm -hmm. WH on it. That became important later. So he had this money and very gradually they realized, you know, we need to turn this into cash now so we can eat, so that we can pay people off. And so they found this person who was an industrialist and very plugged in to the partisan groups, and but also some of the maybe wealthy fascists that, um, you know, maybe didn't want to uh, quite pick a side yet. And so he set up an exchange of these coins in darkness. They had this little boat that they rented. It was actually called Liberia uh, Freedom. And they had to, you know, meet up at random places, uh, hand the money off, and then meet up again to get the payoff from the lira. This was all being done secretly. They were meeting up at, you know, random houses and and because this is a lake community, there's a lot of boats and trips that have to be taken. You mentioned the basilica. So this basilica is important because there's a church, there's a monastery there. Um, Google it sometime, Lake Orta. It's just an unbelievable yeah. 
gorgeous to see, place. Um, yeah, Alps mm-hmm. all around it. And so some of the first offerings they were making were to priests. And I was very fascinated by the fact that these priests were so involved in um, helping the mission because I, I know uh, from being a history student in college, you know, there were a lot of criticisms, particularly of the Catholic Church, uh, you know, and, and the stance it had during the war. The rat lines. Yep. Yeah. So I, I was like, wow, this is a real example of these priests risking their lives and, you know, picking the right side, uh, I, I, at least from my perspective. Um, and so Houlihan had this, you know, exchange done. And, and so they got a tremendous amount of lira because it was the black market. So they got really good exchange rates. Um, and then because Houlihan couldn't speak Italian, he wasn't directly overseeing it. He had uh, Lieutenant Accardi and Giorgio, the partisan, organized this exchange. And when the money was handed off uh, to them, Accardi and Giorgio pocketed over a million lira of this money uh, and later used it to actually start a toy business in the area. And again, you know, I think from Accardi's perspective, um, they were risking their lives. He somehow justified this action, um, later denied it in his book, uh, but admitted it, uh, you know, and we'll get into mm-hmm. that, I'm sure, down the line. But that was a very important piece because when the money got exchanged from gold to currency, um, Houlihan was not aware of just how big a, a haul they got on this exchange. And so he was led to believe, you know, that there was, you know, they only got half of whatever, you know, they ultimately did really receive. The rest went into Giorgio and Accardi's pocket. Um, and that, of course, is important to the story because it, it speaks to, potential motive. Yeah. So as this operation is going on, the threat of being, um, I guess, discovered by the German troops in the area were were quite real. I guess the partisan resistance kept them from coming um, too far up into the mountains where a lot of this was happening. I mean, you mentioned um, the team was sheltering at this villa on Lake Orta. Is it Villa Castelnovo, I think is how you... How you say it? Close enough? That's right. Yeah. And so there were actually two houses, at least two, maybe more. Uh-huh. Uh, they were originally in another house. And, you know, they the thought was we need to move frequently, right? right? We don't want get, to get too comfortable anywhere. The final place they were at was um, the, the beautiful residence you mentioned. Um, and there's some pictures of it on my website for people that want to check that out. Uh, yeah, just a beautiful Italian villa right on the lake, uh, had access to the lake, um, you know, had a basement, had a big fireplace and a very comfortable place to be. Um, the reason the Germans were not just everywhere is they could be picked off in small numbers, right. right? The partisans could actually fight them. So what would happen is they would mount these huge mop-ups and they'd just come in with guns blazing, cannons, the whole thing. Um, so I think probably on most days there was a weird calm, and it was only you know as they became uh, as 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 the Germans became more desperate, uh, as as the partisans disrupted them more frequently, you know the mop ups got bigger and these uh, Americans were just constantly being chased and hiding out, you know, a lot of what they were doing was just killing time. Uh, In fact, I think one of the the tasks they complained about later was Houlihan would try to make them useful so they would do like weather reports uh, and radio those in uh, on days when they had really nothing to do. Um, So, you know, I I have never been in combat, I've never been in in war, but I, I have friends who certainly served and they talk a lot about that, that the downtime is really can be significant. Yeah. Right. And that can also lead people to bad places mentally, uh, especially if they're very fearful for their lives. So I guess we've set the scene a bit, you know, we have, uh, this looming threat of the Germans in the background. There's a lot of money involved in this mission. Um, 
tension within the team, Major Houlihan sort of, um, I guess, kind of in a weaker position. He doesn't speak the language. Uh, and I, I guess that, that brings us up to the night of, what is it, December 6th, 1944, right? That's that's correct. So what what tell us what, what happened on that night? So the, the first reports that came out um, – actually came through a British mission that was similar. And so one thing I didn't mention is that the British also had a team in there that was trying to do the same thing. And there was competition between the um, OSS, right, and and the British secret forces. So that mission was called Cherokee, which I'm fascinated by that name and why the British mission would be called Cherokee. Um, there are some records I have not seen in the British archives. I just couldn't fly out there to do it. Um, but anyway, that mission w- reported that Major Houlihan had been murdered. And how they heard that is really mysterious to this day. Um, Accardi and LaDolce did radio in that the Major was missing, not murdered. So the reports came in to the OSS through radio and the story that Accardi and LaDolce told, these are the two Americans that are uh, subordinates to Major Houlihan. They say that the Germans were in the zone. Um, they were considering moving all day. And finally, around midnight, Major Houlihan gave the order. So because they moved at night, um, they were literally just packing everything up. Um, taking it to the boat and some of them were still, you know, kind of locking up the door and some were already on the boat or right at the the lakefront. And they describe, you know, an ambush. They describe bullets just coming out of nowhere and, you know, just very quickly, instinctively returning fire um, and then scattering, right, for your own, your own hide. Um, So that was the original reports, and so they all ended up in different places. Um, There was a little town named Pella uh, where Giorgio and this this woman that hosted the partisans had a rooming house. So Cardi showed up there out of breath, uh, having run in his uniform uh, past midnight, right? La Dolce, they couldn't find for several days, but ultimately uh, appeared with one of the porters. There were two porters helping them, Manny and Pupo. And um, within a matter of, you know, 48 hours, the whole team had been able to reemerge and and they were able to place everybody. But the one person that remained missing was Major Houlihan. And Captain Landy, who was the the guy that was coordinating uh, with Houlihan to make decisions about the partisans, he came down from Milan. He actually, you know, risked his life to get in the zone and to come down and see what was going on. And there was a woman that named Marina who was helping the mission, and, and he went to her, and she told the story that the mission had been attacked uh, that night. And that they were in the process at this time of of trying to find everybody, but essentially they had been attacked and Major Houlihan was missing. And so his his report was probably the best, most objective view of it because he actually did a survey of the house and the grounds and he picked up the bullets. And his conclusion was they scared themselves. They spooked themselves into shooting, that there was no real attack that they got scared, somebody fired around, and then everybody started shooting, and just they just panicked, right? He he thought it was like just just a you know hysteria almost that overtook them because of their circumstances. I believe I recall you saying in the book too that in this sort of initial search um, at the villa, there were no shell casings found in the area where the German attack supposedly, I say attack in air quotes, where the attack supposedly came from. There were no shell casings found there. Yeah. So you, you kind of have to see it on a map. But so basically the way you enter this property was off like a, a road that, you know, I kind of think of Lake Tahoe. It's like a road that just goes around the lake and there are like these long driveways that come down. And so, you know, 
it's wooded, right? There's cypress trees everywhere. So what he did is he he walked the whole property and he went up to the front of the house, which is you know coming off the lay coming off the road, and at at the beginning of the house there's like these um, ionic Greek columns. Uh, it's like three or four of them, and there were actually um, pieces of them chipped away by the gunfire. And what he could tell was the gunfire had come from the lake. It had not come from the road where the ambush would have taken place. So up there by the driveway, there was no shell casings, which you would expect to find if the Germans had been shooting. Um, The other thing that was mysterious is they didn't burn the house down. And that would be typical of what they would do in those situations to send a message. Right. So they didn't burn the house. Everything was exactly as it had been. There was no signs that the Germans had entered the property. There were no shell casings. The only shell casings were down by the lake. uh, And those shell casings matched the shell casings for the guns that, you know, the mission had. So that's why he basically in his original conclusion, thought they had just spooked themselves and and emptied their, their clips out of fear um, and some terrible accident had befallen Houlihan. Right. So I guess that sort of segues into this nicely. So after this supposed firefight, right, Major Houlihan is still missing. Um, what happened in the initial months following this? Of course, we're getting into 1945 now. Yeah, so we're starting to enter 1945. You know, the war is going to start really coming to a conclusion here. Um, what happens is um, Accardi and La Dolce take refuge on at the monastery, and they start like, it's Christmas, right? And somebody had a birthday, and so they're like listening to records, and they, they, he writes about this in his book about how they, they got this like reprieve from the war. But what's so strange is he didn't actually write up his report until, you know, after New Year's Day. So over a month passed before he actually wrote to OSS to explain, you know, exactly what happened. And, you know, by that time, um, he'd gotten to hear everybody's version of the story, right? So he was able to write, you know, a strategic type of document, Um that if there was something wrong, he could kind of figure out where the cracks were in the story. So that was a mysterious thing. And then then they went to this area called Kwarna, where the communist partisans were, and he just started making it rain guns. Um, they called in tons of drops. They killed a bunch of Germans. I mean, he was a hero to these partisans because they were just getting these beautiful parachutes, you know, coming over and over every week. But it wasn't quite that successful off the bat. He does describe those first couple weeks where there were airdrops that didn't materialize. He talks about being fearful for his life. The partisans might kill him. Um, But ultimately, you know, he got in the good graces of this group. He gave them probably way more guns than they really needed um, and they were able to do some real damage to the Germans. He then dressed up like, uh, he took off his uniform and started dressing up like a, um, telephone repair guy. So he had a bike and he had a fake ID and he was able to move freely throughout the region. And what he did and is very heroically set up all these, um, these cells, partisan cells, and, and got radios for all of them. And they just started really spouting out a lot of intelligence on what was going on. And so, you know, as the, as the Germans were, were being really squeezed, um, you know, his, his group was particularly instrumental uh, in liberating that part of uh, the Piedmont area uh, to the point where when the liberation did come, I mean, he, he was on the airwaves announcing it to the world before the BBC. He had his picture and placard, you know, put up on poster boards. Um, he got the glory because, you know, he was able to kind of complete the mission's work, um, but also do it his own way, which was for him, 
getting the protection he needed from the partisans, living with them in these mountainous areas, giving them what they wanted, uh, and then, you know, using them uh, to, uh, to harass the enemy. So that, that's kind of how it went for them. They really left Lake Orta, you know, and they moved right. on and they started making their way to Milan, uh, you know, and of course the infamous uh, hanging of uh, Mussolini occurs and Moscatelli is, is a big hero uh, among the Italian people in that region. Um, you know, it, the war finally does end. The American forces and the Allied forces cross the, the river and, and come liberate the town. And so... Um, you can see why a story like one missing major would not be as important as these other right. events. So there were two theories at this time. You know, the operation moves on. They still have a job to do. But there were sort of two ideas of what could have happened to Major Hollihan. So he was either, uh, you know, killed or drowned in the lake the night of the firefight, or he was taken captive by the Germans and is being held as a POW in some German labor camp somewhere. And I think uh, Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS, writes to Major Hollihan's uh, brother who worked on Wall Street and basically says, we don't really know where he is, but, you know, we're looking for him. We're going to try and find him to figure out, you know, what happened to him. But of course, you know, after April 1945, the war ends. All these POWs are repatriated. Major Houlihan is not among them. So I guess tell us a bit about what um, initially happened for the search for him in the uh, months and years right after the war. Yeah. So I'll take you back even just a little further. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So the you know, once the mission confirms he's missing, you know, standard procedure, the family receives a notice and there's just these updates that start coming. But one of the more interesting things is that Lieutenant Accardi, you know, now that he's with the partisans and they're starting to have some success, he reports that um, they had captured a fascist, um, you know, in that town Pella where, where they had been living uh, at the time of the attack. And... He actually writes in a report that they mentioned having an American officer and that they were looking for the other two. And so he wrote this in one of his reports. Uh, and that really made people wonder if, if Houlihan was a prisoner of war. So when the war finally ended, there were many iterations of investigations that would start and stop. But I know one of the first ones they went to the lake, they threw a bunch of dynamite in the lake, hoping if his body was there that it would rise to the top, and that didn't happen. So, you know, the first search for his body in the lake was unsuccessful. And over the next years, you know, so I think it was in August when Accardi finally went home, and he was asked questions about Houlihan's disappearance. You know, he was interrogated. Um and told the same story he always told. That there was an attack. Um, you know, one of the investigators somewhere along the lines of like 46, 47, 48 did uncover that they had stolen the money, that Accardi and Giorgio had stolen the money. And so that really was an interesting find. But ultimately, because of the laws at the time, nothing was done about it. Um but I can only imagine being Lieutenant Accardi because he goes back to Pittsburgh where his family has a grocery store. And then one day, um, this investigator from the Army asked him to you know, follow him to a command post somewhere nearby, and they give him a lie detector test. And they don't really know what happened to Major Houlihan, but they wanted to ask him about the money in particular. So I don't know if I'm getting too far ahead of you, but, you know, that that was essentially how it was unfolding, yep. right? Um, there was just sort of a drip, drip, drip over years. Um, I think the guy that got closest to solving it before Manfredi, who's the investigator that ultimately solved the case, was a guy named Lagordia. And I could not, for the life of me, find anything on this person or, or his files. I really would have loved to have seen it. He seemed to have done a brilliant job unearthing some of these key facts that really benefited the final investigation that ultimately was successful. Um, but that, if I go back to that lie detector test, that was the most interesting part to me and a, and a piece I really didn't expect to find. So 
when Accardi was brought into this lie detector on the first day, he failed miserably. Um, when they asked him, did he kill Major Houlihan or did he know if Major Houlihan was killed, he, he, he failed that part. But he did admit to stealing the money. So the person that conducted the lie detector concluded that he must have been so nervous about the money that he did poorly on these other questions, right? So the next day he comes back and they give him like a second try at it. And he passes the part about the murder and still denies having any involvement in any kind of killing. So I thought that was fascinating. We know lie detectors are not perfect right. anyway. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a classic cop story at that point, right? You know, is it a forced confession? Um, is it is it accurate? <laughs> was the lie detector actually working? You know, what did Accardi do to prepare for the second day? Was he on drugs or something that made him calmer? Right. It's it's just it'd be fascinating uh, to know for sure um, all those dynamics. But what I found very interesting is that he did admit in that particular interrogation that he'd stolen the money. And then later uh, and for the rest of his life denied it. So that was the, one of the few occasions where I found him to contradict himself. What was the thought that Icardi did with this money? What we know they did with it because of this LaGuardia investigation is they actually signed a corporation document. So the guy that brokered the exchange for the money, this industrialist, he also <laughs> knew they stole the money because they came to him and wanted to charter a corporation in the middle of the war, believe it or not. They, they started a business, and it was going to be based in this same region, and it actually did become a business. It was like they bought laves and things like that to make wooden toys, and I guess the thought was they'd make them in Italy and sell them in the U.S., so it would be like a import-export type of thing. Uh, Accardi's parents went to Italy, and, and there was some speculation that they may have actually come to Giorgio's house seeking his uh, the son's share of the money because Giorgio being unscrupulous um, may have swindled uh, Accardi's stake in it uh, and claimed that the business failed. So it looked to me like Giorgio was the winner in that, that money exchange because he took Accardi's piece of it, started this business, and Accardi's back in the U.S., and all he knows is the business isn't making money and you're not getting your money back. <laughs> Um, so that, that's still something of a mystery too. Um, but we do know that Accardi's family did pay a visit to Giorgio. Um, and again, the reason Accardi's not paying a visit is, you know, he's, he's not going back to Italy, <laughs> um, because there is a criminal investigation going on about Major Houlihan. And so, that's another aspect is that the Italians actually do conduct a trial and so on and so forth down the road. Um, and so Accardi's never, ever going back right. to Italy uh, and at the time doesn't know that. Well, let's sort of let's sort of move towards that trial. So we're we're after World War Two now. Uh, the OSS is folded into the new CIA, as we all know. Um, and I guess Major Houlihan is at this point is presumed dead. But. His exact fate, I guess, still becomes part of a uh, cold case. You know, there's there's weird stuff about about the money. It's like Icardi fails his lie detector test, but you know, you can't really do um, anything about that. Uh, one thing that really struck me about your book is this is this character. He's kind of a, a playboy foreign correspondent based in Rome, a bit of a, a sensationalist who goes up to northern Italy and and interviews everyone who was kind of in involved in this and draws some uh, conclusions. If you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So there was a journalist named Michael Stern. And I know from a previous book that these guys that wrote for magazines during this time, they were making mm -hmm. a lot of money. And there was a real temptation to embellish, fabricate, you know, and, and they particularly, there was a, a, a deep desire for true crime and sensationalized stories. Um, and so I kind of viewed him as a little bit of a wannabe uh, William Bradford Huey, who I wrote about in my first book, and will one day get his uh, 
feel. If you've seen the movie Till about the murder yeah. of Emmett Till, William Bradford Huey had this sensational piece in Look Magazine where the killers confessed and it you know it was an international sensation and Look Magazine published it. So in that vein, Michael Stern was writing for these men's magazines. There were quite a few. Um, and he he was very connected, right? He had been in the army. He helped liberate Rome. And then he used those connections to get in touch with someone from the CID, uh, the Criminal Investigation Division up in, uh, I believe it's Trieste. Um, the Free State of Trieste is where the army kind of s- remained after the war and a lot of the administration and stuff, um, things that had to be done after the war were done there. So he goes up there and tells this outlandish story about a colonel and getting access to the files and all, so on and so forth. But effectively, what he got was he got the raw work product of an investigator named Hank Manfredi. And it looks to me like Manfredi and Stern were buddies, probably drinking buddies. And that's how he learned what was going on. So he, Manfredi probably leaked most of this directly to Stern. Because what happened is this investigator started operating in the region, taking like a final crack at the case. And what he did is he started by reviewing everything that had been done, and it was hundreds of pages, and he condensed it into one file. So he knew about the stolen money, and he knew other things like the names of the porters and where they live. So rather than send a bunch of Americans back up to this region where folks are obviously very skeptical of uh, really anybody coming in that area after what they've been through, he liaisons with the Italian authorities and they start setting up listening posts. And there's a brilliant detective that just knocks on the door of one of the porters one night and just kind of braces him right there and says, tell me what really happened. And the guy calls for his priest, and there's this very dramatic thing where he confesses. And he tells this outlandish story about how um, they executed Major Houlihan inside the house. They took his body by boat and dumped him in the lake. And before anybody confirmed any of this, it just exploded in the Italian media. So... At this point, Lieutenant Accardi's working for one of the big airlines, and he's living in South America and Peru when he learns about this, right, through these headlines popping up all over Italy. And so Michael Stern can read Italian, so he just basically writes this expose uh, in the U.S. for this magazine based off what the Italians are reporting. Um And so the story does finally come to the United States, and it's framed as this huge expose. They kill Major Houlihan, and the story really does have a moment, right? It it goes viral, as we'd say today, Um, to the point where Accardi's in Pittsburgh, and he has to go on this radio show and just get interrogated about all this, and has basically been accused point blank of being a killer. It does quite a, uh, like a righteous, you know, how dare you accuse me of this? You're kind of, you know, ruining my family, my life, all that kind of stuff when faced with this questioning, right? Absolutely. And then again, you know, I'm a journalism professor, so it's fascinating to me that the mistakes that Stern made. And, and they even had a very famous editor for The New Yorker um, uh, who who was involved in, you know, checking the facts and, and helping write the story. But they ran a photo prominently and identified the wrong people in the photo. <laughs> so, you know, they say this is Lieutenant Accardi and it's not. <laughs> and and then there's these other ridiculous claims in the in the magazine piece that turn out to be untrue. So, you know, we're, we're living in this world today. We're, we're more familiar with it. You know, they nitpick this story. They find a couple of things that are wrong with it, and that discredits the whole story. That was the strategy that Carter used brilliantly. And again, the American public is not being shown any evidence, mm-hmm. right? We're just having to make up our minds based off of what we're reading in the various presses. Uh, but it is covered by the New York Times. It's covered by all the major media outlets. You know, people in, if you were alive in, in 1950, you were hearing about this. Um, and so what happened after that is Congress calls a Cardi to testify. Um, 
And they do it under the idea that they need to pass legislation to fix this loophole I was telling you about where you couldn't charge soldiers for crimes they might have committed abroad, you know, um, if you release them from service, right? So once they're released, you can no longer charge them. They were going to fix that loophole, so they called him to testify about this incident. Um, and basically asking point blank, did you kill Major Houlihan, blah, blah, blah. He says, no, how dare you, you know. Uh, and then they ask him some really funny questions like, why haven't you sued for libel if you're so innocent? And he's, you know, well, I've taken my time. I can do that, you know. Yeah. So, again, I mean, it's just very hard to know who to believe because we don't have the smoking gun, right? We don't have right. the body. We don't have the murder weapon. And and what we learn later is that they actually did have those things. And so what what really happened is so much more interesting. So it breaks in the Italian media, but they still don't have the body. So Manfredi kind of lost, you know, he lost control of his own investigation, right? Somehow this all got came out either through the Italian police or maybe even himself. They actually have a trial in Italy and convict Accardi and the in Adolci, absentia. Right. In absentia. Yep. So yeah, they certainly don't participate. And they use this great argument like, hey, why would I dare go uh, be tried by my former enemy and right. all this sort of thing, right? Um, so it's it's brilliant on their end. Um, and then the, the 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 courts over there have Muscatelli and all these other people, and they start putting out misinformation. And so it's just a big rowdy mess, right? For the it's like a, a big tabloid story in Italy. But again, nobody really knows the truth. But what was happening? behind the scenes and what they withheld. So they leaked, they leaked the confession that the porters made, but they did never, they never actually leaked the key part, which is they did recover Houlihan's body. That just didn't come out anywhere. And there were no pictures of it. There was no documentation of it. So I was very, very surprised when I'm going through these boxes and I suddenly start looking at these extremely graphic photographs of his corpse and what happened is Manfredi, the investigator, took this porter at his word and, you know, put him in a police car and drove him back to the house and said, show me exactly where these things happen. And so what he described is something that's really fascinating because it appears it wasn't the first time that these porters had done something like this. They knew that if they wrapped Major Houlihan in his own sleeping bag after he was killed, they could float his body on top of the water and go out a certain ways on the boat and then just cut the rope and let it sink. And so he wrote an X on a photograph that Manfredi took and said, that's where it is. And so we said, okay, so we know where the body is. How did they kill him? Well, they tried to poison him is what they said. And they actually... Cyanide. Yeah, yeah, so... Yeah. One of the porters had worked for this industrialist and had actually gone and asked him to present this poison, and they put it in Major Houlihan's soup. Apparently, he started throwing up immediately, so it didn't really work. But he went up to bed, maybe wasn't feeling well. And then, whether they flipped coins or drew cards or whatever, Lieutenant Accardi and Ladolci, those two had to decide who was going to do the deed. And apparently Ladolci lost, and he went up there and he put a single bullet, you know, right into Major Houlihan's skull. Um, and sure enough, uh, that summer of 1950, they did grappling. So Manfredi, rather than use dynamite, hired fishermen because they realized the lake wasn't quite as deep as they thought it was, even though it was obviously very cold as a mountain lake. Uh, they could actually grapple the bottom of the, the lake based on the spot that Manny had um, had singled out on the photo. So they start grappling and they do it an entire day and nothing is found. And they come back the next day and just right away start pulling up pieces of leather, a helmet, and then a body mm -hmm. with a gold watch. And the haversack. With the with the initials in the leather, right? They found that too. Yes, they did. So they they take all this stuff and they just dump it right on the 
the grass, grassy area right outside the lake, right, to let it dry out. And then, you know, they start scrutinizing it over a period of days. And Manfredi tells this amazing story of how he went back down to the lake one day uh, after they got the body taken to this uh, area where there was an, you know, an autopsy performed, so on and so forth. He was prepared for burial. He went back down to that area where all the stuff was, and he found a glove. And he shook the glove because he noticed one weighed more than the other. And when he shook it, there's a gold leaf of a major leaf fell out of the, the glove. And he had been given that just the seconds before they flew out because he was promoted to major right, you know, that day they left uh, Algiers. So whoever killed him took the time to take that off of him and put it in the glove. And it was actually recovered. And I'm in the National Archives and it's in this uh, plexiglass thing that they put it in and you can hold it up and take pictures of it. So that was really amazing because in the National Archives, in this prosecutor file, there were all the socks. There was the haversack. There was all of that stuff had been uh, taken up. You know, the government had taken possession of it from Italy and was going to admit it into evidence during a trial. That never happened because of the mistrial. So they found the body and then they also found the gun. Uh, the, the porter... It, it, they used one of the porter's guns, and he had sold it to a neighbor. And so they literally went to the neighbor's house and seized it. Um, and so there's a picture of the gun on my website as well. But again, um, these graphic pictures of Major, Major Houlihan, they just, it was never made public. And, and the public wasn't really aware. Um, they, they knew the body was recovered because they did ultimately have a funeral in New York City, a very beautiful yeah. funeral. At St. Patrick's, right? But, St. Patrick's Cathedral. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, his brother was a big stockbroker, and he just pulled out the bells and whistles. There's a picture in the New York Times of the ship arriving with his casket. There were an honor guard from his alma mater, Manhattan College, there to uh, escort the body into the uh, church. Thousands of people came, including General Donovan. So, you know, it it was amazing to me um, that the government was so serious about prosecuting Accardi in whatever way they could that they never leaked out, you know, the real smoking gun proof that would have kind of ended the debate. So I guess at this point, right, okay, we have the body, we have the murder weapon, we have all this evidence about money being embezzled and infighting within the team. We have these, you know, if inconclusive, but still weird testimony and lie detectors and stuff. Why wasn't, why wasn't, uh, Icardi and La Dolce, the people involved responsible for Major Houlihan's murder? Why weren't they ever brought to justice and, and tried for it? Yeah. So, so the loophole was that if a soldier you know, had served abroad and then was released from the military uh, at the end of their service. No matter what they did behind enemy lines, they could not be charged in American courts mm -hmm. for those crimes. And so they actually did a review, and I think they said something like so there were 75 cases similar to this of things that they know people had done and gotten away with. Now, whether Accardi and LaDolce knew this, I don't know. Accardi did become a lawyer later in life. Um, but LaDolce was working at Kodak when he got the bad news. Um, so he also had an incident where he's at work and an investigator shows up and ultimately he confessed. He actually wrote yeah. out a handwritten confession. Um, and there's some fascinating coverage in, in his local newspaper in Rochester, New York, where he was working for Kodak, where his wife is learning about this from a reporter. Um but he did sign his own confession. He was even asked later, was he coerced? And he said, no, I was not coerced. But he did retract it because his lawyer got involved and was like, you, you've already admitted your guilt. you got to retract it now. Um, Accardi was then brought before Congress and charged with perjury. So he was going to be prosecuted, but for perjury, not for murder. Uh, and again, his trial was going to be in D.C., and this is in 1956. So this is six years after everything kind of busted wide right. open and the body was found. Um, and then the trial just 
fell apart on the first or second day when this congressman basically admitted that this was the plan all along, was to call him before Congress so he would tell the version of the story he published in a book. He actually, Yacardi wrote a book called Master Spy and gave his account of what happened um, and told that same account to Congress, and then they charged him, but the case fell apart. So that's what the government was waiting for all those years. It was waiting for the trial, right, to enter into evidence the body. And what the public would have seen that I've seen is that there's a single bullet fragment in Major Houlihan's skull. Mm -hmm. And it's so clearly an execution because if the Germans really had snuck up on them that night and they were firing in pitch darkness, you know, it would have been a one in a billion shot to hit somebody that square and direct in the head. So he was clearly executed. Um, and, And that's why when I... Again, you're researching this. You don't know who to believe. Um, when you start seeing that type of evidence, you go, how, do you, how can you prove a crime any more thoroughly than this? Um, they have the body. They have the weapon. Uh, they have a confession from the person that fired the gun. Um, they also have some evidence of a motive because of the stolen money and also just some of the disagreements they were having. Um, one of the things I thought fascinating is they asked the Dolce what he thought about Major Houlihan, and he said, I didn't like him at first, but then I did. So it, it appears to me, and this is just my speculation, but Accardi thought this was going to be his mission. And when Houlihan was put in place, he was very resentful. And there's evidence in Major Houlihan's own writings to his commanding officer that Accardi was not taking it well. Uh, that he was acting very uh, sullen and hurt in the hours before they jumped. So you know how that can be in a small organization. If one person is out to get you, he can recruit others. And and it appears they may not have given him a very fair shake uh, even even before the jump. So how long the plan had been in place or what the exact motive was, I certainly can't draw any real conclusion there. The money stands out to me as a very real problem for Riccardi because if Houlihan had found out, we know based on his background yeah. that that would have been a very severe punishment, right? He would have had him court-martialed um, and most likely put in put in the brig. So um, it could be that simple, you know, that Riccardi suddenly realized he had done something really stupid and needed to make this problem go away, and he was – in a part of the world where these porters apparently had some experience doing this because it, in, in some of the testimony, it appeared they had they had disposed of bodies like Houlihan's before. They knew what right. they were doing. Um, and, you know, that, that, that was a, a tough pill to swallow at the end, right, that they killed their own officer. But I think a cool part of the story is there's a guy named William Sulling. He was Houlihan's superior officer. He never was behind enemy lines, but was a very important figure in the war in some ways. He actually accompanied um, Alan Dulles all the way to Berlin and was with Dulles uh, at the time of the surrender and everything. And he wrote a memoir that's unpublished. It's at the University of Virginia. It's one of the most fascinating things I've ever read. Um, So in some ways, I felt like Houlihan's legacy lived on through him and and this service, this tremendous service these guys had, because they were both similar in age, they were older, they were doing this just because they thought it was the right thing to do. You know, Houlihan went over there for no other reason than he wanted to kill the Nazis, and he believed in democracy. Um, you know, he was a true believer in that sense, and to suffer that kind of fate, you know, is 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 heartbreaking. And and really made me want to tell the story once I really saw the truth of it, that there was actually a convincing conclusion you can draw from this. Right. right. So, uh, you know, um, Icardi, La Dolce, because of this legal loophole, they essentially get away with, with murder. What What ultimately happened to them? What were the rest of their lives like? You know, from what little I can gather, um, Icardi's life was pretty amazing. He... Uh, he was in a very long battle with the state of Pennsylvania over his law license. Mm-hmm. So 
they would not give him his law license even after he passed the bar for many years because of this incident. And I think it was because there were people that knew the truth. But ultimately, you know, they couldn't hold out on that line. He'd never been convicted of a crime. It started looking like racism or, you know, some kind of um, uh, problem they had with his heritage. And so uh, being an Italian-American, you know, he was like, you can't do this. You can't treat people this way. And so he was able to get his license. He moved to Florida, lived most of his life there. He has a, still has a surviving family um, um, that, you know, I'm sure probably believe his side of the story. Um, and I think he, he died right after the turn of the century. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, he lived to see the 21st century. La Dolce is a little more interesting, and this is where I broke some new ground. Um, so I started trying to find Carl La Dolce's family simply because he was kind of a pawn of a Cardi. Um, what we know about La Dolce is he... He actually injured himself really badly in the war, and this speaks to the motive as well. So he was so guilt-ridden, apparently, after shooting Major Houlihan that he started having severe PTSD. And he was in a room with the partisans. Remember, they moved with the partisans, and they were making it rain guns. And one night, he just had an absolute panic attack, jumped out of a window, jacked up his back really badly, spent the night uh, outside, nearly died of hypothermia. Um, and then was eventually relieved because he was in such a poor state mentally. So it had a tremendous effect on him immediately after the incident. And then for the rest of his life, you know, he was just chased by this thing to the point where the woman that you read about in my book divorced him. Um, He left Rochester where all his family and friends were, and he moved out to California uh, near Santa Cruz. But the most telling thing to me was he changed his name. He actually changed his last name so that no one would be able to find yeah. him. Um, and I, I was able to confirm that through Ancestry.com, um, through his death records. And so, you know, I could not get any members of these folks' families to talk to me about this. Um you know, and, and again, what would they know? They weren't right. there. But, you know, did did either one ever confess to their families? I'd love to know. Um, hopefully someone's out there that knows the truth will will speak up at some point. Um, I'd be happy to take a call from anybody that wants to talk about it. But ultimately, you know, it looks like they live pretty satisfactory, peaceful lives. I just wonder, you know, in their own private minds, what life was like, knowing what they did. Uh, and how they did it. I, I will say this. In their defense, they were under tremendous right. stress. And they appeared to have serious problems with the way Houlihan was running the mission. There's a scene in Accardi's book, which I do believe was somewhat embellished, but mostly true, where they hit out in the, like, what is the right word for that? Um They hid out above the altar of a church in this narrow little space in like a crypt area or something above the the altar. And they stayed there for like a week and had nothing to eat. And Accardi described the Germans like being right on their tails, you know, right outside the church. Um, LaDolce actually described it differently, said the Germans never really got that close. But they were definitely in that church for a week, scared for their lives, you know. At that point, they may have made the decision that they needed to get rid of Houlihan because he was putting them in this kind of danger unnecessarily, right? So they may have slept peacefully thinking they had no other choice if they were going to survive. Um, But they certainly didn't express those concerns to anybody. There's no record of them documenting that or, or, you know, radioing in uh, concerns about Houlihan, which, you know, most soldiers wouldn't do anyway. Um, They would just take their orders, right? So I, I've tried to give them in some way the benefit of the doubt in my mind that, you know, I don't know the circumstances they were in, but I do believe that they, in a premeditated way, you know, assassinated Houlihan uh, in a very cowardly way, right, when he was uh, in his own bed, uh, either asleep or sick from being poisoned. You're assuming that um, 
you mentioned the sort of cowardly way that Major Houlihan was was killed. I think the big thing that I took away from this story and from you know reading reading your book, um, I think a lot of times when we you know when I guess this is true for listeners also, uh, we want stories to have a happy ending. You know, I'm a I'm an author. I wrote a, a spy novel. You know, that's something that like you have to give people in the end, or at least a bittersweet ending. There has to be a sense of justice at the end. You know, it has to make sense. The people who did the crimes have to pay the price. But I think what's what's so important about this story is that that never happens. And I think it just shows that in life you don't you don't have to have you don't you don't always get justice, you know? Like I'm thinking of like um Eddie Gallagher, the former Navy SEAL who, you know, basically openly admits to in Iraq and Afghanistan, like just committing war crimes. But he's out, a free man today, has quite a I guess fulfilling life and and career. And that's just something that, you know, we have to kind of just accept and and move on. You know, there's kind of nothing that that you can do about that and that's 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 tough but that's tough to you know accept to grapple with but that's that's life that's how things are sometimes um and with this story you know there's a there's a wikipedia page there was a lot of uh press interest back in the you know early 50s when this stuff came out but really nothing can in the in the contemporary record apart from your book there's really nothing out there about this story so i guess what you know led you to this yeah i i I definitely thought long and hard about writing a book that had such a bummer ending right um you mentioned the gallagher case god that's infuriating i remember that very well how trump really leaned into that embraced him embraced him and and used that you know in the same way that they did william calley during uh uh, Mm -hmm. uh calley is from georgia where i'm from and he, uh, you know, he went on to to live a very comfortable life uh, down in South Georgia. I, I don't know if he's still alive today. I think he may have passed a couple did, of years yeah. ago. But, you know, the hero of that story was also from Georgia. He was from Decatur. Um, he was the helicopter pilot. Th- this is during the Vietnam War, just so people are unaware of what we're talking right? Yeah. That's, yeah. You know, Hugh, yeah, Hugh Thompson was a pilot that saw the My Lai massacre happening in 1968 or so in, in Vietnam um, or whenever it happened and, and it came out in 68. But, um, you know, he, he landed his plane and he put a halt to the massacre and then testified. And so I've always wanted to do a podcast or something on this because I went back and saw these like clips yeah. from um, our television station where people are defending Callie and calling Hugh Thompson a traitor, you know, and, and so that's, that's not unique, right. right? That we've had other situations where the, the bad guy wins or gets away with it. I, I do think what I like about the story is just the thought that they had to live with this, right? They had to live with it. And, and I think we all know from Facebook and Instagram, everybody looks so happy on social media, but what are they really grappling with in life? That's a good you know, point. Those, those are dark corners. I, I want to see this made into a movie because I think a great actor could encapsulate some of that, you know, um, in a way that it's hard to do with just the printed word. I'm bound by the facts. I'm bound by what I actually can prove. That's why the book's only 100 pages, because I literally can't answer most questions people would ask me because there's it's so obscure Mm -hmm. but that was attractive to me in the sense that hey here's an untold story here's a story a true crime story that has a really interesting history behind it so it's like true crime with a soul right um and, and you never know right it's like when i heard donald trump use the phrase perjury trap over and over again during his tenure that's exactly the argument that Accardi's lawyers yeah. were making. Um, and it's exactly the reason he did not go to prison for perjury because they did try to trap him. So I was just, you know, like I should write an op-ed for Politico or something at that time. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to waste my <laughs> breath on this. You know, this is yeah. so stupid. But but at the end of the day, like there are parallels, right? There are, there are things we can draw from these stories and maybe not 
right fall into the trap of the Gallagher fanboys out there uh, because what that guy did was just indefensible, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So before we uh, end here today, anything you'd like to add that we haven't gone through already? You know, the only thing I like to say is like, I'm selling this book for five bucks. You can get a you can get a printed copy for five bucks on Amazon. I'm not making any money mm -hmm. off of this. I've lost a lot of money on it. I just ask that people read yeah. it. You know, read it and enjoy it, um, and think about it because you know, I think a lot of times with spy stories, I love spy genres. I, I watch every movie. I, you know, I've read the books, and there's a certain weirdness sometimes around spy stories because we we kind of get so morphed into that world of what it must be like and how it's all a big game i think this story is different because this is what a real spy looks like in world war ii when you're on the ground risking yeah. your life and you know it, it, you, you you see these institutions like the cia and the and and other institutions and, and they're talking about people's lives you know there's somebody out there right now um you know not with the protection of an embassy yeah. that is really risking their lives for our country and other countries and uh, those stories are so hard to find and and to find one this good it's very different circumstance um i think it's pretty unique uh, so people if they do take the time to read it um you, know, you may not read a story quite like this again right I, I think that's a really great point i mean like i said i uh I like, I mean, it's a, it, it's a bummer of an, of an, of an ending, but I like that there isn't that sense of, of justice. I think it gives readers, um, something to try and grapple with at the end, you know, how they, how they feel about that and maybe, um, apply those feelings to these, uh, issues that we have today, you know, whether it's, Eddie Gallagher or the, you know, um, war crimes in Vietnam or, or elsewhere. It's, it's, it's a tough thing. Um, but you know, that's, that's how it is sometimes. Last thing I'll say is, you know, at least, they, at least they got him home. Sure. You know, um, they did get his body back and they got him buried and anybody can pay their respects to him and, in, in Westchester County, um, go to find my grave and look him up. Uh, you'll see that there's a beautiful Irish high cross on his grave. He's buried with his parents. Um, I'm not a very religious person, but I do take some solace in that. And I thought his brother did everything yeah. he could to, to get him home. So sometimes that's the only ending we get, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, I guess that is sort of the bittersweet, the bittersweet aspect of this, that he's not, you know, sitting on the bottom of that lake still today. He is home and he had a funeral. That's right. Yeah. Where can listeners find more about you and your work? So I have a website. It's my name, PateMcMichael.com. Um, please go there. I've got some stories I've written that are even shorter than this. Uh, magazine stories that you can download and read for free. Um, and then, of course, on Amazon, you can find uh, you can find links on my website to, to the book and to other projects I've worked on. Um, in the future, I do have another true crime story I'm hoping to tell. It also has a spy component, um, but I, I need to get busy writing it. So <laughs> hopefully there'll be more for me soon, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know that. I know that feeling. Great. So once more, uh, the book is Operation Chrysler, Stolen Valor Behind Enemy Lines in World War II by Pate McMichael, available on Amazon. Pate. Thank you so much for coming on. It's great to have you. Man, thank you. It's so great to do this. Love your podcast. Wish you guys the best of luck. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. You too, man. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.